curve in Thailand. And these, these uh, tonic medicines include common human foods such as uh, banana, cooked rice, tamarind, uh, salt, but they also include some really interesting medicinal uh, ingredients such as human medicine plants, so plants that are widely used in human medicine like Tinospora crispa, I forget the, uh, the Thai name, my apologies, and yet there's another set of very mysterious medicines, medicine plants that are found in these tonic medicines, um, including um, this erasee right here, which is a plant that has no known use by Karen healers for human medicine applications. This is interesting because elephants themselves seek out this plant in the wild and or in the jungles when they're not um, cared for by humans and consume it on their own. And the Karen Mahouts believe that they know that this plant is medicinal. So what we see here is a kind of a, in this single um, mix of medicinal ingredients, we see things coming from different sources, some of them coming from human medicine and potentially some of these medicines are actually coming from the knowledge of elephants themselves. What's really interesting about this composite category of, uh, of uh, Karen ethno-veterinary medicine for elephant care is that it's clearly a result of the shared multi-species culture that is developed through many generations of close contact between people and elephants. So even though the original focus of this research project was on um, this kind of ethno-medicinal or ethno-botanical question, uh, the, my awareness of the complexities underlying the human-elephant relationship um, as, as it occurs and is performed in, in Karen villages sort of um, emerged out of this project. And so the stuff that I'm, the sort of content that I'm talking about today is a kind of emergent topic of interest that, that came about during this broader research project. So I think that it's worth pointing out that Western audiences um, in general, we, we tend to imagine elephants in the, in the sort of Western imaginary um, with a certain degree of exoticism. Um, we're often picturing them in remote, uh, pristine jungles, something like more or less what this picture displays here. And it can be a little bit of a shock, I think, for a lot of people who first come to Southeast Asia, when rather than encountering this, which is of course an accurate representation of free roaming Asian elephant populations in Southeast Asia, people instead encounter something closer to this, which is of course the, uh, a, more, a more typical way of life for most of the elephants in Thailand. Um, given that the free ranging populations are declining at very great rates, they're also um, in very remote and well protected uh, mountain forests for the most part in national parks, some of the populations are inaccessible and there's also a risk of danger when approaching wild elephants, of course. So in general, the, the experience of most people who maybe grow up imagining elephants like this, when they first come to Thailand, we encounter elephants in a completely different spatial relationship with humans. And these uh, wild exotic animals are actually, we, we have to sort of re-encounter and reimagine them in close relationality with people and in physical proximity and really in a, in a state of constant companionship with people. And um, so this picture of a Karen Mahout really captures that very well. And for me, this entire concept of the human elephant uh, shared culture is beautifully encapsulated by the Hindu god Ganesh, who has the body of a man and the head of an elephant, which is something almost reflected in this photograph here, although maybe in the opposite way. Um, so human elephant entanglements are more or less as ancient as, as any type of human uh, animal entanglement. Um, given that we have very strong evidence that humans have been living alongside elephants and vice versa for four to 5,000 years at a minimum, 
And this, this basically covers all of recorded history. However, going even further back, humans were highly dependent on elephants and other proboscideans, such as mammoths, as food sources um, during early evolutionary phases. And um, it's possible that things like uh, mammoth hunting were actually one of the one of the triggers that caused the um, evolution of uh, hominid groups into more complex social structures. And uh, some, some archeologists have done some really interesting work for showing that elephant uh, bone and tusk carvings uh, may represent some of early, some of the earliest kind of symbolic uh, religious or spiritual practices of early human ancestors. So the human elephant con uh, connection is, is really not a recent thing. Um, it's an extremely ancient thing and it's something that has co-evolved alongside all of the major cultures of South and Southeast and East Asia as we imagine them. Today, it's very impossible to, uh, to think about their history without uh, considering the role of elephants. So coming back to the Karen, um, sorry for this dense text. I, I, I would really like to start uh, describing the Karen human elephant relationship with this Karen elephant origin story. Um, I want to just caution everyone that of the four communities that I worked in, this origin story was only known in one of them, and mainly due to one particular elder from whom I received this story. So I'm going to read it out loud to you because I think it's a really beautiful story and it touches on a lot of the elements I want to I want to describe today. Once a long time ago, a man got married and moved in with his wife's family. His father in law said to him, when you stay in this house while I'm away, please do not open this box. And he showed him which box he should not open. When his father in law went away, the man thought to himself, what is in that box? Overcome by curiosity, he finally opened it, and a white fly flew out and flew up his nose. He sneezed and sneezed, and as he did, his nose got longer and longer and longer. It finally became so long that he could not stay in the house anymore. So he moved down to the ground floor beneath the house where the buffaloes and pigs live. Then one day, the elephant spoke through the cracks in the floorboard and said to his father-in-law, make me a saddle so I can help you carry the rice from the fields. So the father-in-law made a saddle and the elephant helped carry the harvested rice, heavy logs and many other things. But the father-in-law made the elephant work very hard, much harder than he expected. And one day the elephant complained, why are you making me work so hard? So the father-in-law plucked out the tongue of the elephant and put it back in upside down. From this day on, elephants could no longer speak. So, wow, there's a lot going on in this story. Um, it's a really complex uh, encapsulation of all of the tensions and joys of the elephant-human relationship, I think. Um, to begin with, the um, the elephant was originally human, which is uh, worth noting because elephants in Karen villages today really are viewed as members of the family. Um, this is mainly because of this story and this ancient conception that the elephant originated as a human being and through the transgression of taboo actually lost their humanity and kind of devolved into the animal realm. Um, the fault for this transgression is actually laid on the elephant themselves. And this is very interesting to note that, um, for instance, the justification for elephant labor is that the elephant has actually volunteered their own services to humanity as a way to basically stay in connection with human cultures, to stay on the outskirts of the human realm. Um, after losing their human form, the elephant actually doesn't lose their ability to speak, which is very interesting and again shows this kind of ambiguity of what, what really is an elephant. Is an elephant human? Is it animal? Is it something else? Uh, it's very unclear and the story captures that quite well. 
even after the elephant has volunteered their services, um, they continue to speak. And then when they have finally had the, the, um, the sort of final nail in the coffin, the removal of the ability to speak, which is done by the father-in-law, by the humans, whom the, he, whom the elephant was originally offering to help, then the elephant loses the ability to speak, but, but there's no implication that the elephant has stopped to think like a human. And this is also very interesting when we think about human elephant culture. Um, so yeah, I think there, there is something very interesting here in terms of um, the kind of moral ambiguity surrounding the human elephant relationship and the idea that the elephant uh, is in a kind of a, a clear and um, very ancient partnership with humans, but with, um, with really unclear, um, an unclear role, let's say. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that um, Karen people were traditionally matrilocal. So that's the reason why the man at the beginning marries and moves in with his wife's family. So I just, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that this kind of moral ambiguity around elephant care, um, elephant sort of captives and companions continues today. And in the Karen villages where I visited, you have a wide range of different situations that elephants are living in. Uh, many of them, for instance, are, have to be restrained uh, with chains at night because there's no longer sufficient forest for the elephants to be able to wander freely and uh, the, so the chains are necessary to keep them from raiding fields and eating people's uh, food crops. Uh, on the other hand, there's other villages which have maintained sufficient uh, forest cover to let elephants roam more freely and so all of this shows that the, the kind of um, the, the conceptual and physical space in which elephants live is continually in, um, in question and it's continually being dynamically reinterpreted in relation to changing circumstances. So we'll get a little bit more into this later on. What I'm going to do now is progress through the life cycle of the elephant and talk about different kinds of Karen practices that occur at different phases of elephant lives. Um, this is probably a very, um, a very uh, familiar sight to anyone who spent time in Thailand. In the Karen world, this type of Sukhwan uh, offering, which is called Giju, um, is done for elephants at the time of their birth. So when an elephant is first born, um, similar to what would be done for a human being, there is a, uh, a special ceremony held. Um, and this ceremony is a kind of version of the broader anthropologic category of ceremonies that, that are called soul callings. Um, and their purpose is to call any of the human souls back to the human's body that might be missing or in this case, call the elephant's soul back to the elephant's body. And these, uh, these ceremonies are normally done after periods of transition. Um, for instance, birth, long journeys, sickness, or any other um, sort of liminal state. Um, beyond, and, and it's worth noting that this Basi uh, ceremony or the Giju ceremony in uh, Scott Karen is um, performed for humans and elephants and no other animals, which kind of highlights the unique role of the elephant within human culture. There's also another interesting, there's several other interesting practices done uh, at elephant births. I'm sorry, I don't have photographs to, to display for these, but one is that when the elephant is born, it's quite common for the elephant's umbilical cord to be saved. This is uh, not very unusual because in Karen traditional culture, uh, the human umbilical cord would also be saved. For a human umbilical cord, that would, the, the umbilical cord would be actually hung up in a kind of guardian tree. And that tree would, would establish a sort of protective link between the, um, over, over the person, the newborn baby, whose umbilical cord is placed in that tree. Um, 
with and then later on throughout the person's life if they encounter spiritual or physical difficulties they can go to the, their parents or um, relatives can go to that tree and pray to the spirit of that tree to help um, relieve those problems in that person's life uh, so what's done with the elephant umbilical cord is a little bit different but also connected the, umbil the umbilical cord of the baby elephant is saved usually by the woman of the house and dried. And then when, when there comes a time when her own daughters or her daughters-in-law are pregnant, the woman can carefully in such a manner that the daughter or daughter-in-law, the, the, the pregnant woman doesn't realize it, the mother can take some of that elephant umbilical cord and actually prepare a special dish out of it and feed it to the woman unbeknownst so that she uh, does not realize that she's eating an elephant umbilical cord. If, she, if, uh, if this is successfully accomplished, then the birth will be safe uh, for mother and child and the child will be healthy and there will be no problems with the pregnancy and with the birth itself. So this function sort of combines um, the belief in elephants powers of fertility with the sense of elephant or the kind of position of the elephant as a kind of protective, uh, protective, a spiritual and, and physical protector of the, of the newborn child. Very similar to the way in which the tree functions in relation to the young human. The last uh, practice done in relation to uh, newborn elephants or not newborn elephants, but young elephants is that um, there's actually a naming ceremony held when three pieces of sugar cane are cut of equal length and three different beautiful and auspicious names chosen. And then those sugar cane pieces are placed in a line on the ground and the elephant, the young elephant is led out to the line of sugar cane pieces. Whichever piece the elephant picks up first with its trunk, this becomes its name. This is a really interesting um, example of the type of agency that elephants can sometimes play in, in, in terms of shaping their own relationship with humans. It's certainly not the case in most human cultures that humans are allowed to choose their own names, even from a set of options, although I'm sure many of us would, would enjoy that. So after about three to five years old, once the elephant is old enough to uh, spend time, spend more time with humans than it does with its mother, um, the elephant training takes place. And of course, this is a very complicated and controversial topic. And I, I don't know uh, much about it on a very deep level, but the basic process is that the, uh, a corral is built in the forest or on the edge of the forest. And the baby elephant and mother are brought to the corral. Then the baby is placed in the corral and the mother elephant is led away. This is the first time that these two will be separated for a very long period of time. And the separation is deemed necessary in order to help the elephant form emotional bonds with the humans um, who it will then rely on for care for the rest of its life. This is the sort of... Um, what I've just described is this sort of broad uh, physical process, but it's worth noting that in Karen villages, this is not something that's done very lightly. In fact, this is, seemed, this is believed to be an, the most critical period in the elephant's life and also in the human elephant relationship. And as such, there are a lot of different spiritual forces that are appealed to during this process. There are only uh, a very few spiritual experts. There's a, there's a specific position within the Karen worldview of certain people who have inherited along family lines the ability to work with elephants in this way and do this um, elephant separation ritual or elephant training process. And these individuals are um, few and far between today in Karen villages. They will be called upon when it's time to uh, prepare um, when it's time to perform the elephant separation ceremony. And then small ritual altars will be built here at the site and uh, requesting the assistance of, of local landscape spirits, of the spirit of the elephant itself, of the spirit of the humans who are involved, 
and also of ancestors and many other spiritual forces are involved in this process. So um, it's, a, it's a very complex and, and carefully performed thing um, and usually lasts about two to three days before the entire series of ceremonies and rituals is, is complete. After this, the elephant now has entered into the point in its life when it, it can be begin to work with humans as part of human elephant um, labor teams. Uh, of course, today, most elephants are, are um, existing in a situation of, of captivity, which is oriented toward uh, tourism. Um, but that's the case for the Karen in Thailand, not necessarily the case for the Karen on the Myanmar side of the border, where the population is much larger. So uh, that's why I'm discussing the sort of broader elephant life way. But originally, human and elephant uh, teams would work together um, for a wide range of, of work, including, um, well, in particular, as the story indicated, the historical roots of this labor may be linked more with harvesting rice and episodic construction around the houses. However, during the colonial period, uh, logging became an extremely widespread use of Karen human elephant teams. And these teams were widely recruited um, in Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand. Elephants and humans work together through a wide range of different um, tactile tools, such as this, and also uh, auditory tools such as the elephant commands, um, which obviously are, are um, usually given in Thai, in Thailand today, although there are of course Karen forms for these commands as well. This picture shows um, elephants at the edge of an uh, elephant camp. Um, this, is probably, this camp has clearly been um, occupied by elephants at very high uh, density or for a long period of time because the undergrowth has been uh, totally denuded. But you can see on the right the kind of transitional habitat at the edge of this camp as it grades into the secondary forest surrounding the area. I think it's worth pointing out that elephants are, are evolved as edge species. And so it's actually habitats like this where they thrive ecologically. And um, this sort of comes back to the broader question around um, what is it, what is a, a, a wild elephant or what does it mean to, to have an elephant in a, in a natural setting? Many of the, the elephant populations um, have, uh, have actually adapted very well to, to edge habitat. And so the, the sort of um, practice of traditional rotational agriculture or um, occasional low density logging are actually activities that would potentially um, help uh, improve habitat for elephants if they are done at sustainable and low densities, low scales. The situation today in Thailand where deforestation is, um, well, has, has reached um, very scary levels is obviously having the opposite effect on the possibilities for elephant habitat. But historically, if we're going back through the thousands of years of elephant-human um, coexistence, these kind of edge habitats were something that were actually co-created between elephants and humans, because the rotational uh, agricultural techniques used by Karen peoples and other highland groups um, would have promoted positive habitat um, capacity, uh, qualities for the elephants. And likewise, the elephants with their uh, massive effect on local ecosystems would have also helped to control, for instance, um, the thickness of bamboo forests. And um, in their pursuit for food, they would also be um, working as a kind of ecological disturbance regime, knocking down trees and opening up holes in the forest, which then would also help to allow humans to access areas of the forest. So in a way, this question of, um, human elephant culture, it goes way beyond the, its occurrence within actual villages and, and human habitations, but it's something that's also performed on a broader landscape level. <clears throat> I want to lastly touch upon um, one of the most, uh, one of the most important spiritual types of uh, practices and beliefs that current people hold in relation to elephants, which is 
which really has to do with methods of protection. Because as we know, elephants are, well, they're the largest land mammals uh, living today, and they're extremely powerful beings. They have uh, personalities. They can become obviously upset and irritable and frustrated and sometimes violent, um, especially during must period when it's not really safe to be around male elephants. But essentially, there is a risk of uh, that every mahout works with uh, the risk and knowledge of uh, physical harm or even death at the hands of you know your own elephant. So throughout uh, Karen elephant uh, history, there have always been methods, usually spiritual methods, that have been appealed to for protection, um, both against elephants and in order to. Um, to gain power over elephants in terms of authority or the ability to command an elephant, but also in the reverse um, of appealing on the strength of the elephants and their power and uh, potency as an aid against other spiritual forces. So this is very interesting because it sort of reopens the question of that, that ambiguity in which the elephant is viewed and placed. So on the one hand, you can, um, for instance, uh, feed a certain type of stone which has had a kata uh, chanted over it to the elephant and this will make the elephant more docile and uh, more easily able to listen to the commands of the um, mahout or on the other hand you could take the tail hairs of the elephant which fall on their own in a cold early morning um, and weave them into a ring, which is shown in this picture, and then wear that ring on your finger for protection from malevolent or dangerous uh, landscape spirits that might be encountered in, um, in the forests and mountains around uh, a Karen village. So uh, these two different modes of protection are really interesting um, to consider, again, the kind of complexities of this human, human elephant culture. And, and they, they really capture, I think, a little bit the, the sort of push and pull between, um, between reliance upon elephants and also uh, a sense of uh, fear and an awareness of their power and autonomy. So um, this is a, another um, picture of a kind of general um, transitional landscape. You can see here uh, in the background, there's three different ages of forest, which, which um, refer to basically let's see on the on the in the center there's an area of swidden that is growing back from about after about two years of being cut and on the left it's been uh, a, quite a bit longer maybe uh, five years seven years and on the right you have forest which has not been cut for maybe 15 years in the foreground you have something very new in the agricultural landscape of thailand an entire field of elephant grass. And so this elephant grass is grown only to feed to captive uh, Asian elephants that are being kept in, in tourist camps. And the reason is that unfortunately, as I mentioned before, most elephants are no longer allowed to uh, range freely in the forests around Karan villages. Um, instead, because the new model of uh, caring for elephants has turned toward, uh, toward tourism of different forms, it's necessary to keep the elephants, for the most part, for most tourism models, in a certain specific place and then bring people to view them. In order to keep them in that certain place, it means that their time of natural feeding has to be limited. And so then um, the cultivation of, uh, of elephant grass becomes a sort of necessary thing for the maintenance of elephants today. And, and so this really, this picture for me really captures, it kind of tells the story of the past and the story of the present, and it really captures the, the complex and really dynamic nature of the changing human elephant relationships. Of course, as I mentioned before, deforestation is a massive problem in Northern Thailand, and, and in particular around some of the Karen villages where I worked you've seen almost all of the natural uh, forests cut over the last 15 years. Um, the causes for this are, are global or at least regional in scope. They have to do with uh, increasing meat consumption, which is creating increasing um, demand for meat production, which creates increasing demand for 
food to feed the animals, which creates increasing demand for corn, which has caused many Southeast Asian governments to subsidize the, uh, the um, growing, the cultivation of corn, which is now being done on the same steep slopes that were originally covered in uh, forest, which was growing back from various stages of, of being used in rotational agriculture. So this is a, this is this really brings a, a significantly um, a significant question and, and problem to the human elephant relationship because um, as I mentioned before, most of the older Karen Mahouts who were learning to work with elephants um, maybe 30, 40 years ago were involved in different forms of human elephant logging teams where they would actually go into the forest and live uh, in makeshift camps for months at a time in close physical proximity with their elephants and in total reliance upon them. And at the same time, the elephants were able to, to eat um, whatever they wished from the forests. Um, they were not fed specific plants. And then at the end of this uh, period of intensive logging, elephants would be brought back to the forest, uh, back to the home village along with the mahouts, and they would be released into the forest around the village for a period of three or six months. And during that time, mahouts would go and check on them at regular intervals, but, um, but they wouldn't really be coexisting within the human um, village in the same way that they are today. However, with the, the deforestation and the decreasing access that many elephants have toward uh, large forests, um, the situation in terms of elephant health and welfare and also the strains in the elephant-human relationship are, are definitely um, increasing in a lot of different ways. And so it really remains to be seen um, where this relationship will go. Um, some of the rituals uh, that used to be performed for elephants um, by Karen Mahouts are no longer performed anymore. For instance, the ritual of releasing the elephant into the forest when the elephant would be released and then a small ritual altar would be, would be constructed on one of the footprints of the departing elephant where there would be offerings made and prayers offered to request for the elephant um, to stay safe and also not to interfere with humans or disturb the fields or homes of humans during the time that the elephant was, um, was living alone in the forest. So obviously with, without elephant release happening um, quite so regularly uh, anymore, um, this, uh, this ritual is no longer taking place. And so we can see how the sort of physical um, and economic constraints on the human elephant relationship are also um, changing elements of the human elephant relationship on other planes on the on the spiritual and and sort of emotional and psychological planes and, and the culture itself is, is definitely in flux. So yeah, I just want to end with a quick thank you um, to the elephants themselves for being uh, so patient with me and for all of the things that they've shared with us over the, uh, over the millennia and over the years. And uh, thank you all for listening. Um, if you're interested to hear a little bit more about this stuff, I put out uh, an article recently. It's open access in Gaja, the, um, the journal, the academic journal, which is devoted to Asian elephant studies. And that article uh, will describe all of this stuff in, in greater detail and maybe with a lot more clarity as well. So uh, feel free to have a read. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you very much for yours, Alex. Uh, fascinating, absolutely uh, uh, incredible to learn more things than, than we thought we knew about, uh, about what goes on up in the mountains. Of course, nowadays, exacerbated by COVID and a lot of the elephants have now a lot of the elephants that were living down in um, living down in Chiang Mai have now headed back up to the mountain. So there are even more elephants up there in the uh, in the forest, and um, the the mass cultivation of corn goes on unabated as well. So the situation has uh, has not got better, um, unfortunately, with the lack of tourism, and so we have to have to start looking at it as as, as even even deeper. Um, if we are to replace tourism, what should we replace it with? With the number of elephants that we have, so. Uh, 
Yep, absolutely fascinating. Very interesting also about the Bai Si ceremony because that's something I've heard of from the Tai Le in, in Lao as well. So it's it's not just the Karen who have the Bai Si with the elephants, the Tai Le do it as well. So it's a, oh, sorry, these are just things that came into my head. Um, I'm sure there are some questions from Facebook. Um, either U or Nisa, would you like to unmute yourselves and ask ask any questions we have? Okay. Hello. Can you, sir? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Good, 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 good. Hold on. I'm trying to find the question. Uh, let's see. So I have a question from Alicia. She said that, thanks, Alex. It was so cool to hear about uh, what you're doing in Thailand. And hold on. Um, let's see. I'm interested about this edge habitat. Would you say that the elephants were kind of like keystone species when it comes to shaping Thai forest ecosystem? Yeah, this is this is a really interesting question. So elephants have been shown to have several really important ecological roles. And one is, as I mentioned, as a kind of disturbance regime. If we imagine um, a, a, a group of 10 elephants moving through a, a, a grove of uh, bamboo, for instance, um, that habitat does not look the same after they have passed through as before. And a lot of the Karen Mahouts that I talked to actually claimed that with the decreasing, um, the diminishment in wild populations, um, they were actually seeing the bamboo forests get thicker and thicker and more and more impenetrable. So this is really interesting question of what are the effects of uh, losing our wild ranging elephant populations having on the density and makeup of, of highland forests. There's also another ecological role which has to do with seed dispersal. So obviously the elephants are moving in a natural setting. They would be moving very long distances every day. Um, and so when elephants consume fruits and seeds and they pass through the digestive tract, they might be then deposited within a nice, uh, we call it a poop, but we could also think of it as a package of, of fertilizer. Um, and then when that seed is planted with its little fertilizer uh, package, it, it might be planted 10, 20 kilometers away from the location where it was actually consumed. So elephants, so there's a lot of articles on this and, um, and elephants definitely have a critical ecological role in Southeast Asian forests. I think what's interesting for me is also this, this question about how is it that the human elephant, really, you know, the, for instance, the domestication of dogs happened in a similar way where dogs sort of came out of, of the, the um, remote areas and kind of were attracted to, as we talk about it, the edge of the fire and the, you know, the, um, the debris of human habitation. And slowly over time, this edge space between the kind of core human village and this sort of, you know, far away, remote natural habitat, it, it became crossed by dogs. And dogs eventually became then one of the beings which then helped us to access wild habitats for hunting and other things. So I'm sort of pointing out that there's a very similar relationship on a certain level with elephants. Elephants have always been the beings that have allowed groups in Southeast Asia to get deepest into the jungle. If, if, if you want to travel long distances through very dense and remote jungle, you're probably going to need an elephant to ride on to get there. And at the same time, elephants have come out of that jungle and brought with them some of their wisdom, their knowledge of plants, their, their, their um, ways of being, and brought that into the human realm. So this question of edge, the edge habitat and the elephant is a really deep one. And there's many, many different facets we could explore with this. Yep, thank you. Um, and of course, there are there are anecdotes, although it, not not the same as dogs, but there are there are plenty of anecdotes of elephants actually crossing into wild elephants crossing into human habitation, um, and and see, almost seeking out human company is the way it's been put in the in the anecdotes of uh, especially baby elephants that have been orphaned from poaching or have been lost. Um, we knew years ago we knew an an old female elephant in a, in a ranger station down in in the south in Tai Rom Yen who who had lost her herd somehow and she was just she would hang out with the uh, with the rangers at night and then go back into the jungle during the day so um, and also uh, well an elephant camp I knew in Myanmar had a baby elephant doing the same thing so very very interesting um, obviously not not entire herds coming in but certainly 
that crossing of the crossing of the boundary is anecdotally known as well in the in the elephant relationship. Um, yeah, thanks, John. That that's a good point. It really puts in question a little bit the dichotomy of uh, captive versus wild elephants. You know, most of the villages I worked at, uh, the populations had been established by uh, purchasing or capturing long ago uh, one individual elephant who then was raised in close proximity to humans. But because that elephant was let into the forest at times, if it was a female, it would eventually be mated with by a wild bull who would then produce an offspring who is in a kind of a, a hybrid uh, captive or wild elephant who is sort of. So the idea that these were separate populations uh, is obviously not not true. And this constant dynamism between the elephants out there and the elephants right here has always been. Uh, yeah, there's always been a lot of exchange going on. Yep, great. Um, any other questions, Nisa? Yes, 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 yes. Cool, I'll shut there's, up. Uh, let's see. So there's another one from Kim. And this is actually, well, just want to tell Kim that we actually will have a bit of a, an expert that come on the topic of the, well, of the traveling pack of Asian elephant that's coming up in the future Zoom that we, we have. But she wants to hear what is your take on this traveling pack of Asian elephants? What are they doing? Where are they going? And why they're they are traveling so far and these are wow. the ones that have, have moved from Tishuang banner 400 this is these are chinese so just to clarify i'm sure we're talking about the chinese elephants that have moved from uh Pu'e, actually not Tishuang banner um up something like 400 kilometers to a to a to the edges of kunming so just to clarify for anybody else I, i'm sure um alex you know who we're talking about so uh, yes your thoughts please yeah and ahimsa well, will come I, and talk in a, in a in a week or so's time or a couple of weeks and he's following them up there so but your thoughts first well yeah it might be better to leave that to an expert I, after all my I, i'm not an elephant ecologist um so it's very hard to say uh, obviously elephants do range seasonally traditionally elephants used to change locations uh often quite considerable distances between dry season and and wet season um, so when there were much larger tracts of forest available, of course, uh, elephants would be ranging um, through fairly regular patterns, but over much greater distances than they, they roam today. It's likely that the elephant, uh, the extent of elephant ranges has, has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller as they've been, um, as wild ranging populations have been often enclosed into national parks like this group here. So I think, you know, if we think back um, toward, yeah, th this question of, of long distance uh, dispersal. Um, I mean, essentially, there are always pioneer groups that, that, that split off and that travel for long distances and seek of new resources, new habitat. So I expect that if we go back 500 years, this kind of event was probably not so rare as it, as you know, but today, given, um, given how limited these free ranging populations are, especially in places like China, where the population's gotten very, very small. Uh, it seems extraordinary. So I, yeah, I have no idea, but it's certainly hard not to, not to think of it in terms of the kind of cosmic disturbance of the world right now as well, with all of the uh, disruption of our human systems. It seems somehow appropriate. <laughs> I, I like that. Um, yeah, and in, interestingly enough, the, the Chinese scientist who first told me about them said that exactly that, that they, not that they necessarily, not about the pioneer, which is a, a very, a very interesting uh, uh, theory and not one that I'd heard before, but they, yes, it's the first time they've been seen. They, it, that was part of their traditional range, maybe four or 500 years ago, and they hadn't been seen up there. Interestingly, also the elephants of Pu'er were, I, I was up there maybe 10 years ago and they, people were describing me within Pu'er, within that region about how they would migrate from forest packs to forest packs. So your, your theory makes a great deal of sense. So uh, thank you very much. Anything else, Nisa? Yes. So from Jenny, um, let's see, she has, is it now, hold on. Um, she was wondering if you have seen a change in the Mahout elephant relationship in the time you have worked there. Have you seen changes in the traditional ways you describe or are they mostly still in place in the Karen region? Yeah, okay, well, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things happening. I mean, during the time that I, I, I haven't worked with the uh, Karen villages for long enough to have personally seen much change, just a couple of years, but I've, I've definitely seen some changes um, 
in, okay, well, take for instance, the elephant naming ceremony that I described. This is where the elephant is led out to a line of sugarcane stalks with three different names and it chooses its own name. Traditionally, this, these names, for instance, would have been chosen by a, a kind of ritual specialist and a kind of animistic spiritual, um, an elder or a leader within the community who had, who had a kind of authority um, to negotiate with, with spiritual things and obviously name being a very powerful, um, the act of naming being a very powerful tool which defines someone's life. Uh, this was a very important um, moment. So it would have been a spiritual expert who did that. However, today in many Korean villages which have converted to either Buddhism or Christianity, um, we, we see, for instance, Christian um, pastors who have now stepped in to actually play that role of choosing the names. So in a way, this is very interesting because it shows that these, these, some of these spiritual uh, practices or these cultural practices can be reimagined in a new and dynamic form. And so it's very interesting to me that even the overarching religion of the people uh, is less important than the, than the practice of this actual ceremony. And so the ceremony has dynamically transformed itself in relation to change, changing circumstances. And now instead of an, an animistic elder choosing the names, you have the, the, the Christian uh, uh, pastor. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And the other question is from Lori. She asks, can we do an elephant uh, forest conservation at the same time using tourism frames? Great question. Okay, so of all four of the villages that I worked with were running some form of elephant tourism operation. Two of them were doing what we might can call, we could potentially call traditional elephant camps. Um, and two of them were doing something very different, which falls in, into the philosophy of compassionate conservation. And the basic idea there um, is to reverse the direction of movement. Like I said before, instead of bringing the elephants to a place and then having people bringing people to see the elephants. The idea is, is more to leave the elephants out in the forest and then bring people in smaller groups out to see the elephants. And so in this case, um, this organization had actually managed to, to use their, their tourism um, model to pay for um, villages to bring their elephants and mahouts back from other more traditional camps to their home village. So to relocate back home, allowing the mahouts and the elephants to live in the area where they, they were raised, where they grew up, and then pay the mahouts to take care of the elephants on a one-on-one -on -one basis in the forests around the, the village. And then when tourist groups come, they're housed in the village and then brought out in small groups to actually visit the elephants um, in a very personal and kind of one-on-one -on -one way. So I think this is a really interesting example of, of showing maybe, you know, the way in which the tourism, elephant tourism sector is changing, the direction things are going. I, John, I'm sure you're, you know, you're, you totally follow along with this whole trend, you know, that we're talking about. And obviously you guys are part of this. Um, and so, uh, this is one of the biggest changes I've seen that, that definitely has a potential to continue human elephant, um, continue human elephant relationality in a healthy way, but also promote much more sustainable relationships with local landscapes and um, promote forest conservation as well. For well, sure. I mean, that's going to that's going to be the trick. Um, whether it'll ever be enough to to help all three thousand eight hundred elephants is is one thing, but certainly the trick and and several other camps. I think since since even your research or so, I'm sure you've been keeping up to date as well. Several other models have or versions of this model have turned up and are pre COVID were working very successfully. So uh, hopefully, right. it can, hopefully it can it can be something that's expanded and can be used to actually reverse some of this uh, some of this loss of forest to corn. Um, so that will be a trick. The question is, 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 it's whether we, how we can. Whether, I'm sure we cannot, unfortunately, expand it to look after all 3,800 elephants. But it's certainly a, a great business model and, and has, has, a, has a um, many benefits moving forward to to 
the forest and to the community and to the number of as many elephants as we can possibly do for that let's let's see how the world is post covid um that's the other the, the other problem is because we were all doing fairly well at our different business models um some business models more sustainable than others and covid seems to have knocked us all for six but uh the guys who were up there and embedded in the community seem to be surviving better than the guys who weren't so hopefully that's a lesson to to other people as well um even without income they can survive up there so that's that's good well said. Thanks for the comments, John. Very interesting. Sorry, I've gone dark. It's, uh, it's gone dark here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Nisa, anything else? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't think I see anything else here. I think everything's okay. All good. Okay, perfect. Well, in that case, I guess all that it reminds or remains for me to say, and actually is it remains for me to say, is to plug some of our upcoming events. Um, tomorrow, if you speak Thai and would like to know more about wild elephants, and we will be covering, I think, the wild elephants to Ch the wild elephants in China and some migration and possible migrations within Thailand and everything else. We are going to have a clubhouse event, I think, at 7 p.m. tomorrow. We'll put the link. Well, the link's already up. We'll we'll share it with everybody again. Um, Clubhouse with uh, Dr. Matana C. Kachang, Dr. Shution Savini, and Dr. or nearly Dr. Pichet Nunto, um, plus a few other people talking in Thai about um, so Thai language, but uh, talk, talking about um, wild elephant research and wild elephant conservation, and lots of interesting questions that that will come up in that as well. Um, and then our next elephant professional lecture will be about the elephant's trunk, some work that's gone on in, in the US about uh, the elephants and how they use their trunk and how the, the mechanisms they, they use for suction and for blowing and to, to how to access food and water with it. So uh, moving, moving from, from the broader, broader um, vision of, of elephants and people and human elephant relationships right down to, to one particular aspect of the elephant. So it's, it's been it'll be a, a, a fa an equally fascinating talk, I'm sure. Um, I'm back, or we're back tomorrow with a couple of lockdown live streams as well, talking to talking about our elephants. Not quite so scientific, although we will tell the world what we've learned from you, Alex. So thank you very much for that. Um, and then all that really remains after that is for me to say thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Um, your paper was fascinating as well. I do urge anybody, as you did, to look up Gaja, um, which I think is on the Asian elephant specialist group workshop which uh, web page which is www.asesg.org um and i will post a link to the paper as well um which is the what while well, i was always interested in but it, uh, it, karen and different elephant cultures but what what sparked my my interest to ask you to come and give this talk so um thank you very much alex fascinating lecture to learn always great to learn more and more about um about the elephants and the people who who live with them in thailand and who we, we work with closely so very very good to, to hear more about the uh, the history behind some of the things that we see perhaps on a on a daily or monthly basis or we hear about in in tales around the campfire um thank you very much brilliant thank you john and great work with this series I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these things. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you for overcoming also the uh, the uh, the technical difficulties to talk about ancient culture. I quite like I like the par the uh, the dichotomy, if you like, of the fact that we had to battle with internet and everything else from French Guiana to Thailand, so we could talk about these ancient cultures. Um, <laughs> That's right. And thanks for the audience for our patience for that. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. A, a great audience. And um, if there are any questions, we will we will forward them to you later. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Right. You can't see me wait, but okay. I'm saying bye. Take care.